Good afternoon. I'm Shelley Osborne. I'm with ICF. Um, uh, we are joined today with four speakers speaking in this order. We have Shannon Rohall and Juliana Vinulots from the California Department of Social Services. They are going to be followed by Aparna Ramesh with California Policy Lab and then by Annalise Grimm with Code for America. A few housekeeping things before we kick it off with Shannon. Um, there's a chat feature on the right hand side of the platform that you can use to ask questions. You can use the room chat and I'll be monitoring that and I'm assuming the presenters will as well if they're not presenting at that time. Um, you can also, we've had some problems with this, but you should be able to sort of go live um, and take yourself off mute and then either be on video or not to ask questions. So if you want to go that route, you can, or you can use the chat feature. Um, so, and the presenters wanted to encourage you to ask questions during the presentation, especially since right now, at least we have a pretty small group. Um, so if you're like me and you may forget the question, unless you write it down or ask it, <laughs> um, you know, please do so. There'll be pauses, you know, after each presenter, if you have have specific questions for that individual, feel free to ask, or you can ask questions at the end. Um, there will be a survey link that's posted in the chat after the session, toward like the last few minutes of the session. So we encourage you to please complete that evaluation form about the session. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and kick it off to Shannon, who's going to take us through the first part of the presentation. Thank you so much, Shelly. Really appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, as as Shelly shared, my name is Shannon Rohall. I work at the California Department of Social Services and I'm one of the managers that is uh, supporting uh, this project, which is transforming the delivery of anti-poverty tax credits in California. Um, as again, Shelly said, uh, Shannon Rohall joined by Juliana Vignalot, my colleague at CDSS, um, and Aparna Ramesh uh, with California Policy Lab. And finally, rounding us out, we have Annalise Grimm from Code for America. And we're here to talk to you today about the background that has uh, uh, necessitated the uh, solution that we will be discussing around uh, transforming the delivery of anti-poverty uh, uh, anti tax credits in California, um, inclusive of additional information about the challenges that our population faces, the solution, um, including a matched administrative data set, outreach strategies and interventions, including a uh, streamlined tax filing platform um, through Code for America, um, and then of course, evaluating the impact before uh, we move too much further into it, I wanted to provide a few definitions um, to kind of level set a little bit. Um, when we refer to uh, the, uh, the program CalWORKS, that is the TANF program in California. And when we refer to CalFresh, that is the SNAP program in California. Um, another small bit of context, um, California is a county administered um, TANF program. So uh, California Department of Social Services oversees um, the uh, county administered programs um, statewide. Uh, before we get started, um, I was hoping we could just get a little bit of uh, participation in the chat, please. Um, and just give me kind of your knee jerk reaction to this question. Um, one word response describing your tax filing experience to date. So I'll put myself on mute for a moment. Um, thank you, Shelly. I see we have the first response being painful. Cumbersome, nerve wracking, thank you. All right, so many steps, exactly. So uh, I don't know that I necessarily have to connect the dots, right? But I don't think anyone said uh, enjoyable, fun, rewarding. Um, there's nothing really positive um, that people generally speaking associate with filing their taxes. Um, and this is coming from a group of individuals right in this room that I make the assumption um, are probably, um, you know, bachelor's degree or higher, um, probably have um, a fairly well-rounded um, social support network um, to, um, you know, uh, take care of children if children are kind of the barrier to filing taxes, um, answer questions, do another like quick review if you have additional things that you need to take, um, have someone take a look at as you're filing your taxes. Um, and that's generally speaking, not what we observe to be the experience of our CalWORKs and um, CalFresh uh, program participants. Um, and I um, 
think it's probably safe to say that that is a, a similar experience or a similar, um, um, you know, uh, characteristics that you may observe in the populations that you serve as well. Uh, more specifically, uh, here's a, a quick snapshot that we offer from federal fiscal year 2020 um, of our CalWORKs program participants. 38.3% of CalWORKs heads of household were high school graduates. 1.4% had an associate's degree. 0.9% had a bachelor's degree and 0.1% had a master's degree or higher. So anyone that's not represented in that are individuals that we presume uh, do not have uh, even a high school uh, uh, graduate or have not graduated from high school. So consider the uh, responses that we got in the chat um, and within the context of really what the challenges are um, that our um, client population is facing. And with that, I will pass it over to Juliana to walk us through some of the background that precipitated this work. Thank you, Shannon, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, I'll start by setting the stage a little bit for today's presentation by kind of talking about how we got here and what prompted um, this work. So prior to the pandemic, the Department of Social Services had already been looking at tax filing issues among our clients, uptake of EITC, and kind of starting to dabble uh, within that realm. But COVID changed things in this really unprecedented way. Uh, so of course, we know and we see here that unemployment rose significantly. Um, and there was this disproportionate burden of the pandemic's economic impacts on our lowest income families in the state and the digital divide and the types of jobs that our clients typically hold um, sort of accumulated in this um, significant hardship. So I think we all know that the federal government responded with um, a pretty significant investment in families and individuals. Um, and in particular, and what uh, kind of brings us here today um, for this conversation, three rounds of stimulus payments and an expanded and enhanced child tax credit. Uh, but those investments are delivered via the tax system. Uh, and so that brings us to the challenge. Shannon, if you can advance the slide. Uh, so we know that tax filing rates for low income households is low. Uh, and prior to COVID relief, there wasn't a compelling reason for many uh, of these households to file their taxes. Um, tax filing is not required unless households meet certain income levels, and many of our clients have very little income uh, and don't always and often reach that, um, th that uh, filing threshold. But that's changed, uh, and the tax credits that have been, been opened up to uh, individuals and families with COVID relief um, kind of expanded these credits to people who previously could not benefit. Um, so that includes some of the groups that we see here on the slide, uh, including mixed immigration households, adults with no earnings, adult dependents, um, and multi-generational families who cross-claim dependents. Next slide. So as we think about tax uptake and outreach, one of the significant challenges is that no one entity knows who the non-filers are. We have tax agencies who have data and information on individuals that do file their taxes, but they don't know who is eligible and not filing. And then you have state and local human services agencies, such as our department, the California Department of Social Services, and the Cal, you know, California's 58 uh, counties, who serve families that are uh, below the tax filing threshold, but we don't know which of our clients have and have not filed their taxes. So the landscape is such that we now have significant and expanded um, anti-poverty benefits being delivered through the tax system, but we're leaving out the non-filers who are some of the lowest income families and individuals in our communities. Uh, so uh, these two discrete data sets, the tax agency data and the social services data together can tell us who is in that gap, who hasn't filed their taxes, and who do we need to focus our efforts on. So the power of the approach that we're going to talk about today um, really comes from our ability to link up these data sets and partner with our state tax agency and other experts in the field. 
last year at social services, when the first round of stimulus was passed, we wanted to work to ensure that all of our department's clients who could benefit from these anti-poverty measures were provided with a pathway and empowered with knowledge and the right uh, easy, free, trustworthy tools to do so. Uh, and so we reached out to our research partners and our advocate community and other stakeholders to think through a meaningful path forward. At the time, only the first round of stimulus was available. Uh, and since then, with the additional stimulus payments and the child tax credit expansion, that goal has only become more critical uh, and the potential individual impact more significant. And so with that, I'm going to pass it back to my colleague, Shannon Rohal, to move us through the rest of today's presentation and outline the efforts that are currently, literally right now today, yesterday and tomorrow, uh, underway. Thank you so much, Juliana. Um, so I hope that that helped to uh, further expand upon and lay the foundation for the background, which is really the impetus behind the need for a solution, in particular one that is a data-driven approach um, in driving uh, the tax filing of the population that the California Department of Social Services and other TANF, uh, state TANF um, agencies uh, support. Um, in our data-driven approach, we identified three phases um, in order to uh, achieve this goal. Uh, the first phase that Aparna is going to be talking about momentarily is identifying the problem and alluded to by Juliana just a moment ago as well, and which is uh, the merger of state tax filing data with safety net data, thereby identifying Californians who do not appear on a st uh, state tax return. Um, and then finally, understanding those characteristics of the families at risk so that we can craft an intervention strategy that is going to be most effective. A little later on in our presentation, we'll hear from uh, Annalise talking about the available resources to increase tax filing, inclusive of their phenomenal uh, Code for America streamlined uh, portal that will uh, support uh, families in filing their taxes in a more streamlined um, and less burdensome fashion. Um, thinking about the comments that we saw here, confusing um, so many steps, um, very cognizant of that and uh, creating a solution that uh, mitigates those burdens. And then finally, we'll hear again from Aparna as we talk about the need to evaluate, learn, and repeat this work um, in order to um, lift it to the next level and continue to support the families um, and individuals that we serve. Passing it to Aparna. Um, thank you. Um, so as Juliana covered earlier, you know, no one entity has a sense of who the folks are that we need to serve, who the non-filers are, uh, how many non-filers there are, <laughs> uh, the magnitude of the problem, as well as uh, what the characteristics of these families are and what barriers they may face. And in particular, you know, these are federal credits, right? The IRS really doesn't know who these folks are. They don't service folks at the very low end of the income distribution. But one really unique thing is that states actually do. And states actually have a lot of the data that's needed to find that intersection of the Venn diagram, folks who are below the non-filer threshold, who may be at risk of not filing return, uh, and who haven't actually filed a return. So, um, you know, I do think that uh, states have a really powerful role to play in helping connect families who are vulnerable and not, for not receiving these credits to these credits. Um, and some of you may actually be in states where there is authority to pull together the tax data from your state tax and revenue agency uh, together with your own data, see who matches, see who doesn't match, and focus on the folks that in your uh, in, in your caseload that don't match to a tax return. In California, uh, that wasn't the case. So there's actually no, at the time that we did this, there was no statutory authority to allow you know, the Department of Social Services to receive tax data for the purposes of trying to solve this problem. So I'm a data person, and that's where the California Policy Lab came in. Uh, we actually have a data use agreement with the Department of Social Services and our uh, state tax and revenue agency, the Franchise Tax Board. We already had that in place. Um, and so we served as a trusted third party to merge the data on the state's behalf and then produce a list of folks who may be at risk of not receiving these benefits. There's one catch, which is we're not allowed to receive any identified data. So we can't see social security numbers or first names or last names for good reason. We don't want to, um, but that creates a little problem, right? Because in order to match folks across both data sets, 
you got to be able to match on social security and name and date of birth. Um, so we used a technique called hashing, um, which is a fairly simple technique. It sounds more intimidating than it is uh, to sort of receive data that's de-identified from both the tax agency and the human service agency, do the match, and then produce a list that the human service agency can go forth and use to, to solve the problem. So what's a hash? It's actually just a couple lines of code that you can run, well, or that a data analyst on your team can run. Um, and it basically is a one-way transformation of social security number, first name, last name. It scrambles those uh, identifiers into a bunch of characters and numbers and letters. Um, and if both entities, you know, the tax agency and the human service agency, uh, does this hash in the same way um, and shares that information with a third party, the third party can, can easily link the data without seeing any identifiers. And then we can pass that list of non-filers back to the Department of Social Services, uh, and then they can rematch it with the identifiers they need in order to reach out to folks. Um, so this is something that we did. Uh, we're really fortunate to partner with both, um, both agencies to be able to do this. And what's really exciting is that we were one of the few entities in the country, really, that had insight into who the non-filers in California might be. Um, so I want to walk you through a little bit about what we found and what we learned about non-filers in California and the folks that we're trying to serve. Um, so as Juliana said, we started this out when there was one round of economic impact payments, federal stimulus, known in popular culture as the stimmies. Um, and, you know, the real focus here was, you know, who didn't appear in a 2018 and a 2019 tax return? Um, there's something really, there's a quirk about the way that economic impact payments were delivered, right? They were delivered automatically if you filed a return or, and this was an innovation at the federal level, you have, you receive social security. And so if the IRS knows who you are or the social security administration knows who you are, also veterans affairs, um, the federal government was able to deliver the money to you automatically. If the federal government didn't know who you were, um, they weren't able to deliver the money to you. And so you had to take additional action to receive the money. So what we found in California amongst the entire caseload, SNAP, TANF, a couple other safety net programs, around 65% of the folks that the Department of Social Services in the county serve did appear on a 2018 or 2019 return. That means that the majority of folks actually did file a tax return. Um, so that's promising news. However, you had this other, you know, 35% that may be at risk of not receiving the benefits, a good chunk of those folks, of course, received benefits because they were enrolled in Social Security. But we did see that about a quarter of folks who the Department of Social Services serves uh, were at risk of not receiving economic impact payments and had to take additional action. Um, so one thing that really stands out about the makeup of folks who were at risk is that it turns out that about two thirds of individuals who are at risk were actually single adults without any earnings, um, which is also pretty you know, interesting and stark finding. As Julianne alluded to earlier, uh, we're very concerned about the fact that there's some families, individuals who didn't have a reason to file a return before, but we're seeing now it would make sense for them to file a return. Um, just one more takeaway that I think is really important about this is that safety net agencies such as yourself do serve as a part of the non-filing population. So even if you were, look, you were to look across your caseload, there will be folks who are non-filers that are worth reaching out to to ensure that they receive these credits. Um, so we were you know, doing this analysis, and then there was a second round and a third round of economic impact payments. And of course, Congress uh, expanded the child tax credit in a one-time expansion and delivered it in a little bit of a, of a different way than it's been delivered in the past, where if you filed a return, in 2019, you receive part of your credit in an advance payment. And then upon filing a return next year, you receive the rest of that credit. Um, that's a very complicated structure. If you're already filing your taxes, this doesn't really matter to you. If you're entering the space for the first time, it, it takes a while to wrap your head around. Um, but you know, the child tax credit in particular is also incredibly important for some of the folks that you serve, right? Uh, because it's aimed at children and families with children. So uh, I talked about the fact that most of the adults uh, and most of the families that we see on the caseload are actually single adults with no earnings um, who don't appear on a return.
But if we zero in on families uh, and children who are at risk, uh, we learned a little bit about who these children are, what their you know, racial and, and ethnic uh, uh, demographics might be. Um, and so we zeroed in on these children. You know, in California, unsurprisingly, a uh, majority of the children at risk for not receiving the advanced child tax credit are identified as Hispanic. Um, and about one in three children at risk live in a household whose primary language uh, is not English. Um, so this is already helpful in knowing how to sort of craft some of your outreach, right? Um, but one really important component of understanding who's at risk, uh, because a child doesn't, you know, file a tax return. I would never make a child do such a thing. Um, you know, it's an adult who's claiming a child uh, and claiming the, the credit on a child's behalf. And so it's really important to understand who the families are and who might be at risk. And so we did a lot of, you know, analytical heavy lifting to try to figure out who these families might be. Um, and in particular, you know, about a quarter, so about a quarter of the children who we identify as at risk um, actually do not appear with a, an adult on their case uh, here in California. Um, that tells us several things, but amongst that group of, of folks includes uh, mixed immigration status families. And that is another example of a group of families that had very little reason to file their taxes prior to the pandemic. But as a result of many of these tax credits, eligibility has actually been expanded to include citizen children of uh, un undocumented uh, parents or who are living with an undocumented adult. That's true for the federal stimulus payments. And it's also true for the child tax credit. Another quarter of children live with an adult who could be claimed as a dependent on another return. And this is particularly interesting because that adult can also probably claim children on their own return, um, but they do have the profile of a, a, an adult dependent. So this means either they're you know, receiving disability, they have little to no earnings, or in, a pa in the past, in the past couple of years, have actually been claimed on a return before. Um, and so to us, this really underscores a reality that a lot of today's non-filing families are the same families who had little reason to file prior to the pandemic. And so when thinking about this issue and thinking about how to, how to move the needle and, and help these families file, we're talking about all sorts of things, you know, the, the need to know you have to file a return, uh, some sort of, you know, trust building exercise and, and the fact that if you share this information, it's going to lead to, you know, the outcome of getting money. And of course, thinking about how to simplify the process um, for families who may have never had to file a return before. Um, one other note. So there are, for about half of the children, we were able to analyze their household characteristics. And a couple of things really stand out. Um, you can see that even in households with children, about 84% are actually single adults uh, who, are, who are heading the household. Um, and then when we look, we are actually able to observe uh, wage earnings through the Employment Development Department. Um, and the vast majority of, of families who aren't appearing on a tax return um, make little to no in wage earnings. Now, some of these families may have self-employment income. We can't observe that. But even with some self-employment income, they're still likely falling well below the non-filer threshold. So um, I think there's a couple of takeaways I want to hammer home here. The first is, you know, the states have a role to play in this um, and can use available data to try to figure out who may be at risk in a way that the federal government cannot. Um, and the second is, you know, the, the families that are coming up as the families most at risk are families who have very low income. Oftentimes it's single adults, even with children. Um, and then the third thing is safety net, you know, agencies, even if you aren't able to get tax data in, um, you still are servicing a part of the non-filer population. And if we were to look at any sort of actor in this space who has the potential to do outreach, uh, you know, it's human service agencies that really, that really can uh, hopefully make a difference. Um, so, you know, we've actually done a lot of work prior to the pandemic. You may have heard of the Earned Income Tax Credit, which was another anti-poverty tax credit aimed at working adults um, to try to say, OK, well, how do we get how do we increase take up? Um, and so we did a couple of experiments to see, well, if you just tell folks, hey, this credit is out there, you got to file a return to get it. Go file. Here's where you can go file. 
Um, it actually didn't move the needle at all. And one of the reasons we suspect this is the case is because tax filing, as you all noted, is very complicated. Uh, but the good news this year uh, is that there's an innovation from the IRS and, of course, from Code for America that actually simplifies the tax filing process. So I'm going to hand it over to Shannon and Annalise to talk a little bit about that exciting policy solution. Thank you so much, Aparna. Uh, before I pass it over to Annalise, I uh, want to uh, MC for you uh, that we are transitioning now into our phase two, if you remember from the prior slide that looked like this, to talk about our outreach strategy, the interventions that have been developed, and then the uh, explanation of, our, uh, of the better uh, tax filing solution um, through Code for America. Uh, specifically, right, our objective here, I think this probably comes as no surprise at this point, um, is to increase the tax filing um, of our um, CalFresh and CalWORKs recipients um, in order to get them to claim those uh, federal stimulus payments. Um, I also really appreciate the fact that they are called STEMIs in popular culture. Um, the timeline for this work um, is mid-September, which conveniently enough is right about now, um, through to the extended tax filing deadline. And then a little note to add that we actually about an hour and a half ago sent our first round of messages out. So extremely excited about that and happy to be able to share that um, at this time. The modes of communication that we're relying upon for this outreach campaign include recorded voice messages, which is what went out today. Uh, text messages and email messages, um, those of which will be going out um, in subsequent weeks. Uh, in terms of support interventions, um, which is uh, largely what Annalise will be talking to us about, we'll hear about her, the um, Code for America streamlined mobile friendly website um, that offers the option to either file a simplified return um, alluded to by Aparna just a moment ago, um, or filing a full return, depending upon what makes the most sense for the individual, as well as hotline support for clients um, over the phone and completing this process, um, depending upon um, what their needs are. And then a final note, just speaking to the authority to which we rely upon to do this messaging, we have a data sharing um, authority through Assembly Bill uh, 107, Section 26B, in case you're taking notes at home and you want to take and look this up. This is California legislation that gave us the authority to be able to um, engage in some data sharing with um, the California Franchise Tax Board, um, which makes this outreach effort um, all the more targeted um, and uh, effective. And then secondarily, uh, we have our outreach authority um, through Senate Bill 86, Section 4, um, which allows us to engage with clients directly for purposes related to program administration and now outside of program administration provided that it is connected to poverty reducing benefits or public health services or things of that like. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Annalise to uh, listen uh, to uh, the work related to the Code for America platform. Thank you so much, Shannon. And thank you everyone for being here. It's such a privilege to be able to speak to some of this work that um, is truly cutting edge in terms of what we're seeing across the country. And we're really hoping to find other places that are interested in doing work like what CDSS has been able to do in collaboration with Franchise Tax Board and Cal Policy Lab. Um, so again, I'm Annalise Graham. I work at an organization called Code for America. We're a nonprofit based in San Francisco. And in our tax benefits work, we are really focused on ensuring that all families are able to access the tax benefits they deserve. And we've worked with over 800,000 families on some aspect of tax filing over the past couple of years and really learned a lot about non-filers and the, what really they need in order to be able to access their tax benefits. And the most important lesson that we learned is that outreach really is not enough to overcome barriers to filing, that clients really need simple services. So they need to be able to overcome barriers like ID verification and document access, and they need support to be able to file successfully. It needs to be free. So um, it may not sound like a lot of money to access. So, you know, if you have to pay $200 to file taxes and then you're going to receive $5,000 in tax benefits, um, that might seem like it's a trade-off that is easy for a family to make. But actually, if you can't come up with that first $200, then you're not going to be able to access your tax benefits. And we find that a lot of families run into that initial barrier and just cannot afford tax prep help. Um, and then it needs to be accessible wherever they are, wherever they need it. Uh, we have folks on our platform that are using it at 2 a.m. after their kids have gone to bed. And we want to just make sure that whenever someone has a moment and they're feeling inspired and ready to 
start working on their taxes, that they have a way to, to take steps forward and needs to be trusted. We've seen that this space is full of a lot of misleading and untrustworthy services, frankly, and vulnerable families have good reason to be skeptical and trusted community institutions, especially government agencies, can really help point clients to trustworthy services that they know they will be served uh, very fairly with. And then uh, it needs to be empathetic. One of the things that stuck out to us most in our user research with non-filers was that tax filing can be a very emotionally traumatic experience. Aspects like job loss, divorce, death in the family, all of these things show up on a tax return and can really re-traumatize people who have had a really challenging year. And so all tax filing services need to be trauma-informed to help address some of those barriers and encourage people to get keep going, even though it, it can be a tough process. So what are the services that we provide uh, based on what we've learned uh, over the past couple of years? One of them is getyourrefund.org, and that's full service support for both the federal and state return. It's done in partnership with VITA organizations. It's the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program all over the country. Many of you may have worked with them in some way in the past. And basically what we've done is allowed the great services that VITA provides to be brought online. So a client can go to getyourrefund.org. They can take photos of their tax documents, answer some questions in our mobile-friendly format, and then we'll connect them to a VITA volunteer, volunteer, typically in their own community, who will then follow up with them, schedule a phone call, go through their tax situation, prepare the return, and then call the client back, walk through the return with them, and submit it. And so this is very, very high quality, high touch tax prep support. And um, we've really had a lot of success with clients saying they actually had a positive experience during their taxes, which is really wonderful. The next service that we've just started providing as of September is called getctc.org. And it's created for clients with little to no income who just need to access their child tax credit or their stimulus payment. And this is made possible by, as Jenna mentioned, a new innovation um, at the IRS level, which is uh, it's called a revenue procedure that basically means that we can submit a very simple tax return that does not require us to have any income information on it. So um, it's similar to the non-filer signup tool if you're familiar with this on the IRS website, but this is a mobile friendly, version that is interview based. So it asks the clients very straightforward questions to understand things like eligibility. Um, it has chat support on it. So if a client doesn't understand something, needs to ask a question, they can chat our support team. Um, it's available in English and Spanish. And it has the ability to refer people with more complex cases or who would benefit from filing a full return to get your refund to connect with a VITA partner if that would make the most sense for them. And there are some trade-offs between these two tools. And so part of what we're trying to learn in our experiments with California are how do you coach a client through understanding which service level is right for them? So we've also created what we're calling the active choice page, which is a way for a client to really educate themselves about the differences between these two different options. So get CTC requires very little paperwork, the identification process is pretty smooth for most clients. Um, whereas get your refund, you can get all of your tax benefits. You can do both the state and the federal. But if you are missing a W-2 and you haven't been able to get it from your employer and you haven't been able to get it from the IRS, or you can't get through the ID verification process that the VITA programs require, then you may not be able to file a full return, unfortunately. And so get CTC is an option that would work for you. And so um, in part because of the barriers that we've seen people in trying to full, uh, file a full return, we're really excited to be able to op offer a, a simpler op option. And then we're also offering in California a hotline. So we know that many clients have questions and they just aren't sure where to start. And so we also have this need help banner that will direct folks to the California hotline so that they can talk with a VITA certified person and get their questions answered. Just to go a level deeper on that, um, the hotline will really help folks understand the difference between get CTC and get your refund. It will help them if they need to do things like go to the IRS portal to change information if they need to update banking information or something like that. Um, and really it's just a place that they can ask any questions that they have. And we also provide chat support, which is VITA certified tax preparers. And they do a lot of troubleshooting with clients if they get stuck on particular questions or if they've already submitted everything that they need to and they need to just get coached through whether 
now they just need to wait, or if there's an issue that can be resolved, we can help them address that issue. And I just want to do a shameless plug also, because um, especially with TANF clients, public benefits agencies are really the best way to reach non-filers. We've seen this over and over again in our data, and we really want to work with you to help make sure all families are able to access their tax benefits. Like we have in our relationship with California, we have the ability to really provide you with a lot of information about how well your outreach is working. We can tell you exactly how many um, dollars were claimed through this process and uh, really help you see which outreach mechanisms you're using are most effective with your particular clients. And we're really excited to share that the deadline has been extended. So we're going to be able to offer Get CTC through November 15th. And so um, we'd like, love to speak with any of you who would like to chat more about collaborating with us on outreach. And I will pass it back over to Shannon to wrap us up. Thank you so much, Annalise. Um, uh, taking a moment here to dig a little bit deeper into the outreach effort that um, the California Department of Social Services is engaging in, um, as we talked about at the um, beginning part of this uh, particular section, um, we are relying upon um, text message, voice message, and email messages in order to reach um, our um, CalWORKs and CalFresh program participants. Um, in crafting the uh, text messages, uh, really critical to um, uh, craft concise uh, text messages. We're operating under 160 character constraints. So generally speaking, we're not talking about a, uh, a super detailed uh, communication. We're talking about something that's short, sweet, and is uh, really action driven. Um, and then we're also looking um, at uh, the desire to connect uh, to mo uh, connect individuals to mobile friendly resources um, such as Code for America's uh, website in an effort to meet users where they are at. As we talk about voice messages, um, we've uh, created a designated outreach line with uh, pre-recorded voice messages to allow individuals to call back that line and authenticate the integrity of the message that they've received. Um, they also get additional resources um, to refer back to, that, which further takes in, um, uh, adds additional integrity to the message um, and the uh, service intervention that we have designed. Uh, the uh, call to action campaign it includes very easy to follow instructions, including very carefully um, enunciated uh, URL addresses, along with uh, telephone numbers uh, repeated multiple times in order for individuals to really capture the information and take uh, the action needed in order to file their taxes. Um, and then finally, um, as Annalise mentioned, includes the establishment of connection support um, via uh, uh, telephonic and um, uh, and and subsequently web-based um, support um, to really uh, adequately support the individual in their sometimes first time filing taxes ever. Um, additionally, we include, um, as mentioned, um, email messages. Um, this operates as a central um, communication source um, with all of the resources consolidated in one spot. This is very beneficial in a number of ways. Um, it allows the individual to take and authenticate the integrity of the message on multiple levels, but also makes it easy for organizations that we're in partnership with and in collaboration with to support clients when they mention and they say, hey, I received this email message. They can go, you know what? We did too, because we're partnered with this trusted entity. Um, so those are the three messages, uh, message uh, modalities that we rely upon and messages, as I shared earlier, began uh, getting sent. Uh, at, I think, exactly 11.07 um, Pacific Standard Time. So um, delighted to be able to share that with you all um, and looking forward to talking about this project um, further should you decide to uh, move it forward um, in your respective state. To wrap up on our um, phase two outreach key takeaway, um, messages are only sent to uh, individuals that have opted into like a specific modality. And so um, in California, we have a process whereby we collect information um, about uh, text and email permissions for communication. Anyone that does not communicate a, a desire or willingness to receive text or email communication receives a voice call instead, which is our standard communication strategy. Uh, no identifiable information is used during any of these messages. So even our emails um, are very generic and the desire there is to protect the privacy and identity of the message recipient. 
Outreach is conducted um, to the full population with multiple messages. Uh, the desire here is to make sure that individuals that perhaps did not engage with the message initially have a subsequent opportunity to do so. And then tools that are designed for this outreach campaign as Annalise uh, walked us through um, should be simplified and need to be accessible to uh, the individuals that we are serving. Uh, and with that, we take us into uh, the final phase here, which is evaluate and learn with Aparna. We'll listen to uh, information about randomized control trial, the intervention strategies and message engagement, which we are testing, which will ultimately lead us to evaluate the outcome of this um, campaign. And then finally, um, uh, be the impetus behind potential policy proposals um, uh, afterwards. Pass it to Aparna. Sounds good. Um, yeah, so, you know, I think what's really exciting about what we're all doing together is really taking a data driven approach to this problem and the solution. And so we're really building together uh, iterative research agenda, right? We use data to identify the problem. We use data to help drive what the solution should look like. And then the third phase of this is using data to learn from what we did and to do it better next time. So um, we're very fortunate that the Department of Social Services is so data driven and, and so committed to using evidence um, to, to sort of learn uh, how, how to constantly do better. So in partnership with Code for America and CDSS, as well as the California Policy Lab um, and another research center called the People Lab, which is helping run this evaluation, um, we're really trying to drill down to three questions. Does the non-filer tool, does a simplified return process on its own increase tax filing? Does offering assistance, such as the hotline or the chat, increase tax filing? And then what types of messages get people to actually take action, right? So there's you receive a phone call or you get a text message. There's the initial barrier of getting you to the website, which is, you know, what the message might say, who the message might come from, how you might have received the message. And then there's all of the questions of what your experience is like to fill out the return uh, to get you over the finish line. Um, so to do to really evaluate this question, we built in uh, a randomized control trial. Uh, some of you may be familiar with what this is. Basically, you sort of randomly assign folks to different experiences uh, or in clinical term a treatment. Uh, and then, you know, those groups are fairly similar, except for one component, which is what their ex experience, you know, what treatment they may receive. So, in some cases, some folks are being routed to getctc.org, some are being routed to get your refund. And so we can compare all else equal uh, what the final outcome might be across those two groups. Um, or some folks may be routed to receive assistance and some folks may not. And so we can compare what the effect of receiving assistance is on your eventual filing of return and receiving uh, these benefits. So, you know, a lot of our analysis uh, was taking a look across, you know, folks who are enrolled in services at any point over the last year uh, or the last two years or, you know. Um, of course, the Department of Social Services only has the ability to reach out folks who are actually, you know, currently enrolled. Um, and so we've sort of whittled down the list to about 500,000 households, which is a lot of households. Um, and, you know, as Shannon uh, pointed out, we're going to be reaching out to folks uh, through phone calls, through emails, through text messages. And we're going to be able to see a couple of things, uh, especially because of our partnership with Code for America. So one is, you know, do people actually land on the website? If we contact them, uh, you know, do they actually type in getctc.org or do they click the link on their phone and, and, and reach, reach the actual resource? Once they reach the website, uh, what do they do? So do they actually interact uh, and, and sort of engage with assistance? Uh, did they end up calling the phone line? Um, and then did they actually start a return, <laughs> right? Like that at the end of the day, you know, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of preamble to getting you to start the return. So do you make it that far? Of course, the final outcome we're very interested in is, is the return submitted and eventually accepted. Um, and this is a learning process. This is the first time that, you know, the state of California is embarking on this exercise using all the tools in its arsenal to sort of help deliver, you know, these, these benefits to folks who need it. We're going to learn a lot. Um, there's going to be a lot of folks that won't respond to some of this, 
you know, some of this outreach, but there will, you know, in the event that there are some folks that do, we'll be able to tell a little bit about what helped them, you know, get over the finish line. And at the end of this exercise, we're going to have another list of people. It's a list of folks who didn't file a return, who, you know, the Department of Social Service contacted and said, hey, there's this tool. Some folks may use that tool and we'll know who those folks are and we'll get a better understanding of their experience. And then there are going to be some folks who don't use that tool. And so, you know, that's part of the iterative learning process. Let's unpack the experiences of folks that didn't use the tool, understand what their barriers are, and try over again next year. So this is really exciting. Um, it's, it takes a lot of, you know, commitment uh, from different partners to put together. But, you know, once you're on this track, uh, it's a really valuable way uh, to, to sort of learn and do better constantly. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think, Shannon, did you want me to cover the slide? Sorry. I'm happy to. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Okay. So, you know, I think um, the the recommendations that we'll make don't just apply to the state of California. They'll be really important to, you know, at the federal level for different states, and as well as the way that the federal government thinks about structuring some of these benefits and the resources that are available. You know, in California, counties have a have a big role to play too in in sort of interacting with clients and learn a little bit more about the role that they they may be able to take as well in some of these efforts. Um, I think what's really exciting about this is that we are able to look at sort of the county level. Of course, in California, there's so much variation uh, in the experiences of folks that live in different counties, um, <clears throat> and so you know, we'll I, I believe we'll be passing on county level data to folks and county level analyses where possible. Um, and I think really what's really exciting about this is this is the first year we're trying to, we're, we're doing this and the Department of Social Services is taking the driver, you know, the wheel of the car and, and helping guide, guide, guide how the state uh, tackles this issue. And so I think what's already happened is a lot of really cool partnerships between different stakeholders. Um, and I think we're looking forward to this, you know, this problem isn't going away. Um, you know, we're going to continue to deliver some benefits through the tax code. Uh, and like our data shows for most families, even those, you know, the lower end of the income distribution, uh, this system actually works for them. But for that last mile of families where it's very difficult to file a return, where there are a lot of barriers to entry, we have to figure out how to close the gap. And we have to figure out how to service those families well. Um, so yeah, I think we'll, did you wanna do this slide, Shannon, or? Sure, yeah, I can pick that up. Uh, that is fantastic. Thank you so much, Aparna. Um, as we are getting close to uh, wrapping this um, up, I uh, wanted to invite you all to uh, uh, enjoy a little bit of uh, uh, guesstimating here. Um, and we offer the opportunity to drop in the chat whether you think it will be option A or option B um, that will get the most engagement from our clients. These are um, actual text messages that are being sent out, um, option A. Um, says this money already belongs to you. Uh, go to www.getyourrefund.org to claim it today. Data rates may apply. Reply stop to opt out. Or option B, where we've made it easy to claim your payments online. Go to getyourrefund.org today. Data rates may apply. Reply stop to opt out. Uh, we had a lot of engagement with our counties in terms of what they thought would be the better um, option. Um, these are both uh, text messages that will go out um, and our evaluation that Prana just talked about will tell us um, which one is going to get the greatest engagement. All right. Okay. Seeing mostly mostly opinions that A is going to work. Uh, we've got We've got one vote for B. Um, and uh, it's probably clear to you guys right now, but we don't know either. Um, but that takes us uh, very conveniently into um, our closing slide here where we talk about next steps. Um, please be on the lookout for when the full report and evaluation materials will be shared at the completion of this report. Um, and it will answer this, uh, this great question of whether option A or option B was most effective. Um, in addition, um, we'll be sharing a... Um, uh, we invite you to um, connect with Annalise um, to uh, partner with Code for America should you desire to uh, set up a similar partnership within your, uh, within your state um, to drive um, tax filing completion. Um, we'll also be sharing a toolkit in the uh, future to support hashing and the merge code efforts that Aparna uh, referenced, as well as additional information that may be beneficial 
um, to counties and getting their own outreach infrastructure uh, created. Um, and then finally invite you to um, visit our um, uh, 2020 tax filing and resources hub on the uh, California Department of Social Services website. I'm happy to put that into the chat um, in the event that this is not an interactable um, uh, link here, which I suspect it is not. Um, so happy to put that in the chat and invite you to take a look at um, the information that we have curated. Um, and then with that, I uh, would like to take a final moment to thank um, our partners um, with California Policy Lab, uh, Prana Ramesh, and Code for America, Annalise Grimm, as well as the partners that we have in uh, addition, um, our uh, grant funder that has supported this effort, Crank Start, um, in allowing us to uh, move into the space of direct client communications um, and our evaluation um, partnership with the uh, People Lab um, through UC Berkeley that are supporting this work um, in the evaluation space, as well as, of course, our partners in California, um, uh, with the Franchise Tax Board um, and other individuals within the State Human Services um, Agency um, that have begun collaborating with us. I'm very excited to be able to share the results of this um, critical work. Um, and I will uh, pause now and invite uh, any conversation or questions that come up, um, including would be great to also hear um, in the chat or uh, otherwise um, what states you all are um, representing um, in this uh, um, workshop right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to jump in just for a moment and let folks know if you didn't see the chat, but apparently it isn't possible to unmute and talk during the session. It's not set up that way. So please do use the chat feature. Um, if you have any questions, I haven't seen any come in, um, but we definitely have some time left in our session today. And um, I have a couple questions, so <laughs> we'll see whether anybody posts any questions and, and then I will be a bit selfish and ask some of my own. Just as a heads up to everybody, there is a link to a survey in the chat. So thank you, Brian. So to answer Shannon's question, do folks want to um, put in the chat just what states you're you're dialing in from? And while folks are doing that, um, I'll ask one of my questions with the um, disclaimer that I do survey research and program evaluation. So I'm going to be focused a bit on some of the methods that you guys talked about. Um, so for folks in California who opted in to receive, you know, say phone calls and email messages and text messages, um, how are you staggering those different modalities? Are you using all of them? Are you doing phone and email and text? Um, or did you sort of pick one? I'm assuming you're doing multiple modes, you know, at various times, but if you can talk a little bit about how that outreach strategy is going or, or was decided, I guess. Sure, I'm happy to start. And uh, I think, you know, Shannon and Juliana can probably speak to the, the constraints of opt-in, et cetera. But yeah, so, you know, our ex ante from doing this work in other settings for other benefits uh, is that the text messages are probably going to be uh, are going to um, are going to lead to the most hits <laughs> in terms of uh, traffic to the website. Uh, in fact, in a prior experiment we did with uh, some counties in California that were administering CalFresh or food stamps and SNAP, um, you know, the, the click through rate was around 14 percent. Um, and so, you know, that included folks who were filers and non-filers. Um, so what we did was we've actually built in two different randomized control trials. So anyone who's opted into written communications, we have a different RCT for. And then for folks who didn't opt into written communications, um, the Department of Social Services does have the authority to still place a phone call to, to sort of notify those folks uh, of the benefits. So anyone who's been, who, who hasn't opted into written communications gets put in another randomized control trial. Um, which focuses on which which only uses uh, voice calls to um, to deliver messages for folks that opt into um, text communications, and I want to say it's about twenty percent of folks. So it's it's not trivial. We have a pretty good sample for that evaluation. Um, I want to say like half of them also opt into email. So you basically get whatever modality you opted into on the written side. <laughs> Um, you know, we've, of course, stratified the sample to account for some of these differences. Um, and 
the just like another sort of twist to this is uh, for folks who are opting into the uh, the text messages, what we're really going to be testing there is the nature of the message, right? So what gets you to the website? Uh, and those two messages that Shannon shared are the two messages that we're going to be testing. And then once folks do reach the website, we actually have uh, two, two treatment orange as well. So some folks are going to be randomized into receiving uh, assistance. Uh, in a salient way. So there'll be a banner that says, call this phone number, or use the chat if you want more assistance. And then other folks are going to uh, be randomized into not having that banner. Uh, so non-salient assistance is what we're calling it. And so we'll also be able to measure amongst that group uh, whether or not providing assistance, or at least marketing that there's assistance, uh, will, will make a difference. Uh, amongst the, the phone calls and that randomized control trial, what we're really looking at is um, sort of, it's sort of a policy question almost, like which tool or which combination of tools uh, uh, does the best job? So the sort of perfect form, our ideal form <laughs> is, uh, you know, you have, you're routing folks to get ctc.org, which is a simplified portal, and you're providing them with the salient assistance. So you have a hotline or, you know, once they get to the web page. Um, they see both the hotline and they see that they can also do chat. Um, a second arm is just going to have the simplified portal. Um, no sort of assistance made salient, no hotline number, you know, prominently shared. The third version or the third arm is going to actually route folks to getyourrefund.org. Uh, and we suspect our hypothesis is this will probably be get the least action because uh, we know it's very difficult from prior work to sort of route folks to filing a full return and then expect that they're going to file a full return. Uh, and then the final version is what sort, uh, sort of Annalise showed. It was a page which gives both options. So you can file a full return. You can file a simple return. Uh, you know, here are the trade-offs of doing either of the strategies. Uh, you pick one uh, and you go with it. And the, the sort of hypothesis there is, you know, it may be that when folks commit to picking one, uh, they may actually be more invested, you know, in sort of the process of trying to navigate some of the some of the complexities. Uh, but again, this is an experiment, so you know we have some priors, but we'll see we'll see what happens. And what languages are is is the assistance and are the materials available in? Shannon, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So the initial, um, th there, there are two different answers to that, actually. Uh, the first answer is that um, tax filing through Code for America, and I can um, pass it to Annalise to speak more to this, um, is uh, provided in English and Spanish. Um, we also offer translations of the um, text messages, um, uh, voice messages, um, all of the scripts in our other um, top five non-English threshold languages um, hosted on our website. Um, if you're looking for it on the website, it'll be up in just a day or two um, for uh, getting uh, the uh, translation finalized. Um, and then um, as we kind of, uh, you know, kind of consider lessons learned and such like that, um, we'll also, of course, look to identify what um, future iterations of this um, activity uh, may include in terms of like a greater support um, of uh, the languages um, uh, spoken within uh, California. Great. Thank you. And in terms of the California hotline is in English and in Spanish and our client support is in English and Spanish as well. All right. Okay, well, um, we haven't had any questions come in through the chat. We do have um, some time remaining, but um, I don't have anything else. Um, is there any sort of last words or any information you guys want to communicate to folks before we, we end our session? I can say just uh, thank you very much for those that joined us. Um, and thank you again to the partners that have um, supported CDSS in this effort. Um, it's very much appreciated. And then a final plug to any of those um, uh, TANF programs that are looking to get this moving in your state. You do still have time, as uh, Annalise mentioned, um, the uh, deadline has been extended to November 15th. So we're no longer looking at less than a month. There's actually a sizable amount of time to be able to get some stuff going, at least um, in a pilot form. Um, and really, um, you know, as we're saying, move the needle and get things uh, uh, aligned to the folks that are being served. All right, thank you all so much. This is very, very interesting. Um, you know, uh, 
wondering how it's going to turn out. <laughs> so, you know, maybe we can get some, you know, in a, in a few weeks, I might, I might reach out and find out how the campaign is going and what successes you have. This is very interesting. So I thank you so much for those who joined and to our presenters um, and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.